Plays a ton. Plays after games, before games, every day. Just a lot of fun. I hope the professor makes it all the way. Kid got game. Mad game. He gonna put it down. <laughs> this little town in Oregon, be the man. Be the biggest man in Southern Oregon. Yeah, I'm gonna name the street off. Let's go. I had a great childhood. I was born and raised in Kaiser, Oregon, a small town that's actually an outskirt of Salem, Oregon, the state's capital. I started playing basketball at two years old. My dad put the basketball in my hands at a very young age. His passion for the game wore off onto me almost instantly. I think by about third grade, I realized that I loved the game of basketball and that's what I wanted to do for a living. So also in fifth grade, I started working with a trainer who showed me a lot of the fundamental skills I needed for ball handling. So he showed me the in and out dribble. I remember that was the first move I ever learned, the in and out crossover, then the Iverson crossover, and almost a few sessions in with him, my talent for handling the basketball sort of was revealed. You know, I think that people would identify me as like the white kid with handles by about sixth grade. It was evident that I had like a God-given gift to handle the basketball. Coming into high school, you know, my freshman year, um, I started watching the And One Mixtape Tour. I remember I got, the first tape I ever got was M1 Mixtape Volume 1, uh, was Skip to My Lou, and that was a huge inspiration to me. I had liked the excitement of the game, like, like I was kind of a flashy player to begin with, you know, knowing how to cross over and handle the basketball well, but I remember when I saw the M1 Mixtape, it kind of like inspired me to be more creative with my game. So it inspired me to take my creativity to the next level. Um, I lived the and one lifestyle. I had the clothes, trash talk tees, um, the long shorts. You know, and one was the first company to make long shorts. So like if you had long shorts at the park, you were like a baller, you know what I mean? I had the shoes. If you even watch my senior year of high school, I'm wearing and one shoes. Instantly took a liking to that style of basketball and you could see it in my play. You know, if you watch me my sophomore, junior, senior year, it was definitely flashy. I was always very small, um, though skilled. So freshman year, I remember I started on the freshman team. Uh, sophomore year rolled around, played on the JV team. And then come my junior year in high school, uh, I was held back on the JV team again, which was like a big hit to my pride because I lived and breathed basketball, you know what I mean? So to, to be held down on a JV team as a junior when all my friends, my peers, and everybody else is on varsity, that was like, that, that shook up my world. You know, I, I think I, in the long run, I think I needed it to make me more hungry, but I was hurt by that. So, played JV, uh, did really well. I think I averaged a lot of points. I probably averaged over 20 points, a few assists. Um, and then my senior year, uh, it was looking like I might not get much playing time on the varsity uh, team at the school that I was at, McNary High School. So I ended up transferring to the small Christian school it's a private school, it only had like 300 kids, Salem Academy Christian School. Ended up playing varsity there and I did really well. I got like second team all state, uh, started every game. I played like majority of games. Coach kind of let me do what I want. He let me have a lot of freedom with calling ISO plays and, and creating for my teammates. I had the, the ultra green light, you could say. So it was a good experience, senior year. I thought after having a successful senior year, you know, I would get some college offers, you know, maybe some letters, 
some calls for some coaches. Um, but sure enough, got no offers, nothing. So I was scraped down to basically it was looking like I wasn't going to play college basketball. And so it was a walk on situation or nothing. So I tried out for three different community colleges. And the one that I didn't try out for was the local college, Chemeketa Community College. So lo and behold, my dad had formed sort of a relationship with the coach of the college because he sold him his wedding ring. My dad owns a jewelry store. Through their exchange or whatever, uh, my pops had convinced the coach to give me a look. And basically he you know, told him I had a passion for the game. I got some skills. I just need, need a shot. I had a great season my senior year at this private school. So the guy actually let me go try out. And so coach was generous enough to at least give me a look. So I went and walked on for the team. There was no guarantee I was gonna make it, but uh, at the end of tryouts, coach said I could have a red shirt spot on the team. So it just so happened that before the season, three guards on the team had gotten injured and they needed an extra guard to step in as the third string point guard. So I ended up filling a roster spot freshman year, um, played about three to five minutes a game, but if the game was close, I wouldn't even go in. After my freshman year in college, my work ethic for the game actually increased because I realized what I was up against, right? I'm getting up 6 a.m., getting up 500 jumpers before class. Everything got stepped up to the next level in a matter of like three months. I literally tell people I improved about 300% from the spring to the summer after my freshman year in college. At that same exact time, it just so happened that and one uh, was doing a mixtape tour nationwide, 33 cities. And on this tour, they were having tryouts before every game, giving the opportunity for people around the country to compete to be on the and one tour. And the summer long contest was covered on a reality TV show on ESPN called Streetball, and there could only be one winner. So I ended up trying out. Uh, all the and one guys were out there watching me. Players I had looked up to, you know, Hot Sauce, uh, Alimo, AO, of all these guys whose game I really admired, they're out there watching me. I'm just excited to play with Hot Sauce, Alamo, all these dudes I've seen on tape. I see them in real life, it's almost like, it's just like a dream, you know what I mean? Played against Team at One, I went back and forth with Hot Sauce a few times, and I think I only played like 10 or 15 minutes that game, but when I was in, the crowd was electric. This is Sizzle, looking at it, Sizzle, Sizzle! Hey, go right back at it. Say I know after that game, they had to pick who they thought was the best contestant to be able to advance and go on tour with them. They selected me, they asked me to come on tour, and I was blown away. through the summer and end up playing at Madison Square Garden in front of a sold out crowd. A lot of people that were big in the basketball community were there, NBA players, and I ended up hitting a game winning shot. We beat Team at one. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
behind the three-point line, I just let it go. Like, I was like, forget it, you know? Let it go. Went in, game over. Went by one. 10,000 people in the Mecca. That's a big time shot right there, man. In my opinion, Professor just won the contest. Yeah, right there, 18, you know, winning the contract, um, signing, you know, with, with Team Man One, that was that was the beginning of my career. I ended up playing in like roughly 30 countries during my An One run. And half of those countries I went to like five and six times because we would do them every year. You know, Japan, you would do every year, Philippines, Australia, Brazil. Those are places I've been to a bunch of times. Got to meet a ton of celebrities, got to meet, you know, tons of pro ball players. It was really the opportunity of a lifetime. I had a great time being part of N1. Jason Boucher, aka the professor. It's good man. Every time I come to Japan, I always have a good time. Especially the people that host us. They're real like hospital. You know what I mean? And they're um, they'll go like go out of their way just to make sure that we have a good time and we're comfortable. So the people are always cool, the fans always show love. And um, it's a nice city, you know, Osaka and Japan are real nice. I think this is probably my fifth year here, fifth time coming back to Japan, so it's always a good feeling, man. I always have a good time. What I try to show the fans consistently is that I get better every year, that I make improvement, and, um, you know, I usually do that up, so up until now, so I don't think tonight will be any different. I just want to show that I've showed improvement from the last year, and we keep doing what we do, and that's, that's put on, you know, entertain, entertaining show for people. Can't really say what I want them to see. Just improvement. That's the only thing I can guarantee. So at the end of 2008, our contracts expire and we don't even really get a call that we're no longer with the company. I think that it was just sort of insinuated that we should know our contracts and know that our time ran out and there was no talk of like re-upping or any mixtape tour in the works or anything. So it was like instantly over. And I remember 2009, uh, the economy took a dip. We're in the midst of a serious financial crisis and the federal government is responding with decisive action. People were less inclined to put on entertainment gigs because that's not a necessity, you know, that's extra. And so me personally, I ran into financial troubles, you know. I remember at one point, I was virtually broke. I only had a couple hundred dollars in my account, not knowing how I was gonna pay rent for the next few months. It just so happened that I kept like 50 to 100 of my N1 jerseys. I don't even know why I actually kept them because I gave out quite a few too, right? I played hundreds of games, but my collection of the ones I did keep was numerous. But anyway, I had all these and you know, it came down to a situation where I knew I had a bunch of value on my hand and I had to make ends meet. So decided to give it a try, sold a couple, boom, made a quick 600 bucks. Just two jerseys, bang, bang. And I'm like, whoa, I, I, I could live on this for a while. You know what I mean? Not knowing there were, well, knowing there weren't other opportunities available to stay afloat, so see how big it is current day. I haven't, I haven't worn this since 2003. Fits perfect. <laughs> I'm ready to go, are you kidding me? Ah. Yeah, by selling my jerseys on eBay anonymously, I was able to sustain for about six to eight months. And then comes uh, 2010, and opportunities picked up a little bit. Um, enough to sustain, but I wasn't doing great, that's for sure. So, early 2011, uh, a new tour emerged, uh, a new company called Ball Up, and they wanted to pick up where Anwan left off, but sort of center the company in streetball. You know, for me to do these one-off gigs for a few years, it was hard because, you know, I, I didn't know, you know, one month you might have a whole bunch of gigs, the next two months you might not have a gig. So. You know, it was hard to make ends meet at certain times. So this was a big opportunity. Uh, we were excited. So we're getting ready to debut Ball Up here in Los Angeles, All-Star Weekend 2011. We're excited about it. We were staying out late, hardly getting any rest that weekend. And I remember 
Saturday night, I was calling Escalade to come to this event, you know, to meet down in the lobby, let's go to this event together, but he wasn't answering. And it wasn't like him. Um, so I figured, you know, we didn't get any rest the prior night, so maybe he's just wanting to sleep. We go through the clinic with the kids, and you know, it was a good event, but I remember afterwards, I was curious, like, I gotta call S, see what's going on, but before I could, they pulled me aside, and they actually told me that he passed away of a heart attack the night before. They found him in his hotel room. You know, instantly for me, it just shook my world up, you know what I mean? It was tragic, you know. His passing really brought me to a place where I started to ask myself the bigger questions of life, you know what I mean? You know, what, what is my purpose? What am I here for, you know? Um, why, why would Escalade die right now, you know? Well, what do I do next, you know what I mean? Like, he, he was a big homie, mentored me on all things, like, where do we go from here? And I remember going to his funeral in New York, and his brother was, uh, Escalade's brother is Mark Jackson, uh, who most people current day probably know as an analyst, but, you know, he's a great NBA player. So he started talking about God, he started talking about Jesus Christ, he started talking about forgiveness of sins, I remember he was doing an altar call at the end. He said, hey, you know, if you want to go where my brother was, um, you know, feel free to come to the altar now and give your life to Jesus Christ. I don't know if you know, but the Bible says that we walk by and not by. I remember I just felt compelled to go up there, gave my life to Jesus Christ and asked for forgiveness of sins. And then literally after leaving that funeral for the next, you know, year or two, I had a really life-changing transformation and my life was completely changed from that moment on. By about 2013, uh, I had still been working on YouTube and I was to a place where I think I had 50,000 subscribers or something like that. My friend and I, uh, Robert Monroe, we worked on this concept uh, that was actually a prank video called Spider-Man Basketball. And it's basically where I dressed up in a Spider-Man costume. You know, we picked that superhero because it didn't show any part of my skin. I went to the court and I played people one-on-one. -on -one. For the first video, I remember I went out there for like 20 minutes, didn't even miss a shot. Every trick I pulled off just was like flawless, it just like worked out, you know, it was one of those things that was meant to be. So after Spider-Man basketball, you know, instantly changed my whole career, you know, revamped my career. I instantly go from 60,000 subscribers to 400,000 plus in a matter of a week and it's been incredible opportunities. So ever since then, now, you know, YouTube is my full-time business. We've got a staff up here, you know, running Professor Live. We got tons of endorsements, content campaign opportunities. We still do the live events, but really now it's about the content. You know, God's blessed me with the opportunity to be able to start a clothing brand, Global Hooper Apparel, and we're looking to expand on that. It's really just been a blessing, you know. All sorts of opportunities have come from YouTube and I never envisioned that, you know what I mean? I always had envisioned either playing the game conventionally or street ball on TV. So being at this, the digital era, you know, has emerged and been, you know, a means of a career and a new way to influence others. It's really been a blessing. I originally came up with the name Global Hooper in 2011 uh, when I started an Instagram page. You know, at the time I was only doing games internationally, and obviously it was a hooper, so I figured, hey, Global Hooper. And then over time, you know, the name sort of had a ring to it, but, you know, basketball for me has obviously been, you know, a means of career and helped me to have influence with a lot of different people everywhere, but it also has been something for me that's helped me to create friendships and relationships with all different, you know, types of people all over the world, you know, different ethnicities, different cultures, and so, for me, when I think Global Hooper, it's, it's not just myself, it's, it's a community. It, it's people all over the world who are passion-driven and who like the game, and it's a way that we can unite people through the game of basketball. I'm really looking forward to people being able to experience this journey with me this year. We're gonna be in Africa, we're gonna be in India, Taiwan, Philippines. We've got some local events in the works. I'm starting my brand, Global Hooper. Uh, it's gonna be a big year and I cannot wait for people to experience it with me on a much more intimate level than they ever have before. The goal is to inspire others, you know what I mean? To, to influence people, have greater influence.
on the next episode of Global Hooper. <laughs> 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 <laughs>